Hi, I'm Beth. And I'm Marty. We host an Emmy-nominated TV show produced by the National Air and Space Museum called STEM in 30. And today we are joined by NASA astronaut Chell Lindgren. Chell spent six months on the International Space Station, and he has just been named to the Artemis crew, which will put the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. Chell, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, everybody. It's so great to be here. Thank you for uh, this opportunity. 2020 has been a rough year for all of us, but NASA's done some pretty incredible things and you were involved on the last mission. Do you want to give us sort of an overview of the exciting things NASA's been doing in the last year? Sure. Well, like you said, 2020 has been a rough year. Um, and uh, like most everybody else, um, many of us have been working from home for the most part. Uh, but despite that, we had uh, ambitious plans and have still uh, still carried through on those. And, and so um, it started uh, in May when we launched the, uh, the Demo-2 mission, Bob uh, Bacon and Doug Hurley on a SpaceX Crew Dragon uh, on a mission to the International Space Station. That was a test mission to really um, just kind of work out the, uh, this new vehicle, make sure that uh, we were able to dock to the space station and and uh, do some on-orbit uh, operations and then come back home safely. And, and the vehicle just did, uh, did a terrific job. And so we quickly turned around and then prepared for the Crew-1 mission. And, uh, and so that was um, the first long duration mission for the SpaceX Crew Dragon. And again, we launched uh, just uh, last month and sent uh, four astronauts to the International Space Station for a six month mission. And so very exciting time. Um, ambitious plans in any t at, at any time, but the fact that uh, that we were able to pull this off to get these vehicles ready to fly, to continue to do the training and all the things that we needed to do uh, in the pandemic environment really speaks to the, the innovative spirit and the flexibility of the NASA um, and our commercial car partner, uh, in this case, SpaceX team. So uh, it's been a very exciting year. Um, for the agency, for SpaceX, and uh, for our country, and um, also exciting for me. So I got to serve as the backup for both the Demo-2 and the, uh, the Crew-1 missions. And so, so much fun to learn um, these new vehicles and to work alongside these crews as they were preparing for their missions. Chell, what great things does NASA have in store for us in 2021? Well, if, if uh, this year wasn't exciting enough, uh, 2021 uh, looks even more exciting. We're going to continue to do, uh, I would say, groundbreaking science, but let's say orbit-breaking science on the International Space Station. Uh, this is a vehicle that has been, had a continuous human presence for over 20 years. And I mean, if you really stop and think about that, very few of us drive cars that are 20 years old. And yet we're in this incredible vehicle doing science on, and research on a daily basis to extend our presence in the solar system and to make life better back here on Earth. And uh, so we're going to continue to do that, uh, that science. And we have this new vehicle that is going to be carrying our astronauts to and from the space station in the, uh, the, the SpaceX Crew Dragon vehicle. And so we'll see one, maybe two more launches as we take, uh, take our uh, crews to and from the International Space Station. Now, in addition to that, um, <clears throat> Marty Beth, as you just mentioned, we just named the Artemis team. And so 18 astronauts were named to this team to help really pave the path uh, for human missions to um, and around the moon. And so we are so excited about that. Uh, we are excited for our country and for our international partners that are going to be joining with us in that. So the very first part of that Artemis program is the launch of the Artemis One mission. And so this is that whole launch system, the, uh, the space launch system with an Orion capsule on top, um, taking an uncrewed mission out to really kind of, again, test that vehicle and make sure it is ready for the first crewed mission, which is going to launch in 2023. Awesome. Well, Chell, we've got a bunch of kids in the background ready to ask you some questions. Are you ready? I am super excited. All right. Azura, come on in and talk to Chell. Hey, Azura. <laughs> Hi, Chell. My name's Azura, and my first question for you is, how do you prepare to go to space? Well, thank you, Azura. Um, that's a good question. I mean, we even if we're going to go on a trip or we're going to go camping, we have to prepare. 
And, uh, and so when, the way that we prepare for space is that uh, we have a whole number of skills that we have to learn to make sure that we are ready to live and work on the space station or to live and work in the Orion capsule on our way to the moon. And uh, for astronauts, that means um, learning how to do spacewalks, learning the systems of the, the spacecraft that we're flying in. So when I prepared for my space station mission, it meant um, learning all the systems uh, of the International Space Station and how to respond to those if, there, if something broke, if there was an emergency. Uh, we have to learn how to use the robotic arm uh, for the space station and there is a, a robotic arm planned for, for the gateway, uh, which is orbiting around the moon. And so that's, a, that's something that we'll continue to learn. Um, we fly in the T-38. It's a supersonic jet. And it helps us practice um, kind of our mindset and how we act as a crew, uh, but in a plane here on Earth. And so uh, we want to expose all of our astronauts really to that kind of um, high intensity environment where we have to talk communicate efficiently uh, within our crew and communicate efficiently with people on the outside. So when we're in the jet, that means talking to air traffic control. When we're in a spacecraft, it means talking to mission control. Uh, we need to know how to use procedures efficiently and how to deal with emergencies and understand that our decisions in the plane can have life and death consequences. And so we, we expose our crews to that, uh, that environment so that they are prepared for that same situation when they're in space. And then because we work with international partners, particularly for the International Space Station program, we all have to learn the Russian language. And, uh, and so all of those things taken together uh, ultimately prepare us for our, our flights into low Earth orbit and beyond. Thank you. And my second question is, how long does it take to go to space? How long does it take to go to space? This is really, this is a really interesting question because um, when we talk about going into low Earth orbit, and so that means uh, launching on a rocket and getting to a point where we are then essentially in orbit around the Earth and you don't need to fire the rocket to anymore to, to, to stay up there. Um, we'll do adjustment burns and those sorts of things, but it means getting into low Earth orbit and we're essentially falling around the Earth at that point. Um, that only takes seven and a half to eight minutes. So from the time that we launch to eight minutes later, we are in low Earth orbit. We're in what we would kind of describe as space. It takes longer for me to get to work. So that's a pretty amazing thing. Now, when we go to the moon, it's going to take a little bit longer. It'll take us about three days to get to the moon and three days to get back. Um, but when you think about it, the fact that it only takes eight minutes to get into to space, that's a pretty amazing thing. Great job, Azura. Thank you. Yeah, next, thanks, Azura. Next up, we have Monica. Monica, do you want to ask your questions? Hi, Chell. My name is Monica. And my first question is, how big is the International Space Station? To put it in terms that we might be able to understand, the if you put the International Space Station down on the Earth, laid it down on the ground, it would cover a football field, an American football field. The internal volume, so that is the place where, the, the inside the, the cylinders or the modules where we live, we've got the volume or the room of about a five bedroom house. So that starts to give you a sense of, of how big it is. But I remember when I did my first spacewalk and I got outside in my spacesuit and I was starting to, to move around on the outside, um, that is when it really hit me, just how massive the structure is. And it takes a while to, to move from one, if, even from the middle of the space station where our modules are out to the end of the space station where I had to do work. Uh, and so to look at that and to understand that this amazing structure had been built over decades um, by multiple, multiple crews doing multiple spacewalks um, from multiple space shuttle missions, it's really a testament to what we are able to do uh, with our international partners. My second question is, what happens if you get injured in space? Ooh, that's a good question for me. So my background, I'm actually an emergency medicine doctor before I became an astronaut. And then uh, I learned aerospace, I trained in aerospace medicine before I got a job as, an, uh, as a flight surgeon at NASA. And a flight surgeon is 
just kind of a fancy name for a doctor that takes care of the astronauts, that takes care of the crew. So if you get injured in space, we do have a small medical kit on the space station. And then we also train our astronauts. Uh, we give them about 40 to 50 hours of training to be a crew medical officer. And so what that means is that if somebody were injured or became ill in space, then um, our astronauts would have the training to be able to work with the flight surgeons that work, that work in mission control. And, and our astronauts would understand what equipment is available and what procedures are needed to be able to treat that astronauts. So we would, we would call them like physician extenders. That is, uh, they would be the eyes and ears and the hands of the flight surgeon that's working in mission control. It would help to treat the astronaut that's ill or injured. Now, when I flew on the space station, and I have a lot of friends in the astronaut office that are also doctors. So when one of us flies, then we have a little bit more capability. So if somebody got sick on the space station, we would be able to take care of them, but we would still talk with our flight surgeon teammates in mission control to make sure that everybody understands what's going on and that we're doing the right thing for our, our crewmates. Great job, Monica. Jack, are you there? Do you have a couple of questions? My first question is, what does it feel like when you're in zero gravity? Well, zero gravity is awesome, Jack. Um, I know that a lot of us have a dream of like, man, what it would be, what would it be like to be like Superman or Thor or Iron Man and to be able to fly. And when you're in weightlessness, um, you kind of get a sense of what that's like because you can just push off from a wall and float down the, you know, the entire length of the space station if you're really good. If you're not so good, if you're brand new to the space station, you tend to run into walls and knock stuff off of the walls and bounce all over the place. It's kind of like a pinball. But, uh, but you have that ability to just push off and to float. And so that is really, really cool. Um, oftentimes when we're just hanging around talking, I just I caught myself uh, one day that I was standing there talking with one of my friends and, and uh, I, was, I was just doing flips in place as we were talking just because it's fun and it's something that you can do. So being weightless is, is really fun. Um, and, and when you come back to earth and you feel gravity again, you really kind of appreciate what weightlessness is like because gravity, it turns out, it's kind of a bummer. Um, so when we get to space, we really appreciate that ability, uh, ability to float around. Uh, next up, we have Wesley. Wesley, do you have a couple of questions for Chow? My first question is, um, what do you eat in space aside from space ice cream? Okay, good. So here's, here's my, uh, my guilty secret is that there, I know there are a lot of people that don't like space ice cream, um, or astronaut ice cream. I actually really like it. In fact, my parents live in the Washington DC area. That's where I used to, that's where I graduated from high school. And so every chance I would get, I loved, loved, loved to go to the Air and Space Museum. And every time I would go there, I'd buy, buy a package of astronaut ice cream. A lot of people think it tastes like sweet um, styrofoam, but I actually like it. The secret is we don't actually have that in space. We don't have astronaut ice cream in space because it is so crumbly. If we open that packet up, just that ice cream dust would go everywhere and make it be, it'd make a huge mess. Our space food lab does a really good job of trying to provide us with a, a, a wide variety of very tasty things to eat. So we have stuff like beef stroganoff and chicken teriyaki. We have shrimp cocktail and uh, banana pudding. Um, so we have a whole variety of things that we eat. Half of it is dehydrated. So we have to add water to rehydrate it and let it sit for a little bit. And then half of it, is what we call thermostabilized or irradiated. And so that is food that has been fully cooked, sealed in a bag, and then heated to a really high temperature or irradiated to kill off the bacteria. And that lets it sift, basically gives it a long shelf life so that it can be there for six months and it's still, um, still edible. So all of those are pretty tasty. If you've ever gone camping and eaten camping food, it's kind of the same, same stuff. And, and my favorite thing to eat was actually one of the desserts. It was chocolate pudding cake. Um, so that's what we eat in space. Thank you. Um, I have a second question. Okay. Where do astronauts sleep while they're in space? 
Yeah, so we, in the space station, we have small um, rooms called crew quarters. And they're about the size of a small closet. For those of us that are a little bit older that remember what uh, this is, it's about the size of a phone booth. And if you watched an old Superman movie, you'd see how big a phone booth is. But it's our area for just kind of, it's our private space. It's where we have a laptop where we can answer email, read a book, and it's where we sleep. And uh, so we have our sleeping bags there in our crew quarters. And uh, you get in there. And so I didn't tie my sleeping bag down. So when I got in my sleeping bag to go to sleep, I would just be in my sleeping bag and I would float around in my crew quarters. And I like, to me, it felt like I was sleeping on a cloud and I slept really well. Great job, Wesley. How about Cole? Are you back there? Do you have some questions for, for Cho? So my question is, when have you done anything bad? Oh, when have I done anything bad? Oh, man. You're going to get me into trouble here. Here we go. Uh, Let's see. Hmm. Michelle, where are you bad at anything? Oh, am I bad at anything? So we are, uh, we are ex there are a lot of things that we're expected to do as astronauts on the space station. We have to be good at using the robotic arm to capture um, cargo vehicles or to, to move our friends around during uh, spacewalks. We have to do spacewalks. We have to do science. We have to do repairs. And so I think all of, all of us astronauts would describe ourselves as a jack of all trades and master of none. That is that we have to do a lot of different things, but we're not super great at any one of those things. Um, I would say that what I am bad at is going to sleep on time. I have a trouble doing that uh, here on earth and I had trouble doing it in space because I was just so excited to be there on the space station and to look outside the window, um, to answer email, to talk with my friends, but it's so important to get enough sleep. And, uh, and it's important here on earth too, especially for you all, you all are growing and sleep is what, um, I mean, it helps your brains grow, it helps your bodies grow. And we need sleep on the space station because if there were an emergency at any point during the day, we need to have enough rest um, and reserve to be able to respond to those emergencies. And, and so getting enough sleep is super important. And it's one thing that I could definitely be better at uh, if I get to fly to the space station again. Thank you, Cole. Um, I have one more question. Okay. When I give you the word, what did what you this? do before, before coming an astronaut? Yeah, so I was actually a doctor, Cole. I'm, I'm an emergency medicine doctor. And then I learned aerospace medicine, which is a very small specialty. Uh, but then I went on to work at NASA as a flight surgeon. And so a doctor that takes care of the astronauts. And so for me, being a doctor was an incredible privilege to get to, to take care of people. Um, and so it was hard to give up that job, but, uh, but becoming an astronaut, being an astronaut has been a lifelong dream. And so I think it's probably the only job that I would have traded being a doctor for. And I feel very lucky to, to have, have, have gotten to work as a doctor and now to get to work as an astronaut. Next up, we have Ellis. Ellis, do you have a couple questions? Hi, my name is Ellis. Um, my first question was, what do you do in space? Hey, Ellis. So... I flew to the International Space Station on a Russian Soyuz rocket. And so we are, uh, we are partnered with many countries and I feel very, uh, very lucky to have gotten to ride on that rocket to the International Space Station. And once I got on the space station, I spent um, 141 days doing science and research. Uh, so the, the International Space Station is a unique, a very unique um, laboratory. Because of weightlessness, we're able to do things on the space station that just don't really work quite as well here on Earth. We can study fundamental physics, how fluids move, um, like the forces of capillary motion and surface tension, how those can propel fluids in the absence of this overwhelming force of gravity. Uh, there are some protein crystal growth and medical um, experiments that, that also uh, or can be done in weightlessness that, uh, that just can't be done on earth. And so I saw over 200 different experiments while I was up there. And then some of the other things that I did was uh, the space station is we've been living in it for almost 20 years now. 
And so there are sometimes there are pieces of equipment that are either old or have uh, stopped functioning. And so we will repair or replace that equipment. Sometimes we're installing new equipment. And then I got to do two spacewalks. I actually got to go outside of the space station wearing that amazing white uh, spacesuit and, uh, and some, do some repairs on the outside of the space station. And then also install some new equipment uh, to prepare for the, the new spacecraft we have coming to the space station now. And, uh, and so they keep us very busy, but it's very rewarding at the end of your mission to just kind of look back at all the work that you were able to accomplish. My second question was, how do you land without getting hurt? That's really important because when you've been in space for six months, your body actually, uh, we exercise a lot, but we, we, we would call ourselves deconditioned. That is, we're not used to gravity. And if we didn't work out, our bones would be more brittle, our muscles would be weaker, our, our hearts, our cardiovascular systems would not be as efficient. And so we would be very prone to injury. Now, thankfully, we work out every day on the space station. We, we spend two and a half hours working out every day so that we are in good shape when we come home. But the, the spacecraft designers still spend a lot of time making sure that when the spacecraft lands, that it does so softly enough so that the people inside are not injured. And so that means um, orienting the seats in the right way, making the seats have kind of shock absorbers in them, building uh, the parachutes so that they carry the, the capsule down uh, slowly enough so that when it hits the ground or hits the water, that the occupants are not injured. And so we're really grateful uh, that those engineers are taking so much time um, to preserve our safety. Great job, That's Ellis. Cool. Iso, are you back there? Do you have some questions for Chow? Hi, Chow. My name is Iso, and I would like to know, can you take pets in space? Hey, Iso. That's a great question. Um, I feel like I kind of took a... Um, my pet into space a little bit because, uh, so we have a dog named Pippin. Um, she is a uh, half Labrador, half Corgi and her fur, if you have pets, you know, their fur get, gets everywhere. And, uh, so I just imagine that like a piece of her fur went with me into space. Um, I know that a lot of people would like to, to bring their pets to space. And we haven't done that yet, but I'm sure that as we move uh, into more frequent flights, that, uh, that somebody's going to be bringing their pet with them. Now, we have taken animals to space before, and I think that our astronauts have kind of adopted them in the past. So we've had spiders, um, fish, and, uh, and so seeing how these animals react in, in that environment. And, uh, and I think that we, we're even flying mice right now. Uh, we had kind of a pseudo pet when I was on the space station. Um, so my friend Scott Kelly was up there during his one year mission. And, and I think he'd either brought or found a globe, like this clear globe. It's like a, it's kind of like a hamster ball. And he had put Skittles inside of it. And so that was our, our, our pet Skittles. And we had that because it's very interesting when the space station reboosts, when it actually fires its thrusters and moves, you can see this ball move around. And so, um, that, that's one of the little things that we would do with that is watch that as we were actually firing thrusters uh, to reboost the space station. But that was kind of our, our, little, uh, our little token um, pet while we were on the space station. Now in the, in the Soyuz rocket, we were, we were allowed to carry something with us called the weightlessness indicator, um, or in Russian, it's the Nevisomosti indicator. And so this is a little, typically a little stuffed animal that we would have dangling on a string so that when we got into, when we got into orbit, it would stop dangling, it would start floating. And, uh, and so ours was a little R2-D2, which was pretty cool. My second question is, can you draw pictures in space? Yes, you can draw pictures. Now, it's a little bit harder because we're so used to kind of sitting down at a table, putting a piece of paper on the table, having our pencil and drawing. Um, and so if you put a piece of paper on a table in space, it just kind of floats away. And so you've got to kind of control that and there, you don't really sit down. You, you hook your toes underneath a handrail to keep yourself in place. So it's a little more difficult, but I do know that, that many of my colleagues, uh, made drawings while we're up there. And that's something that we're really excited for as space flight becomes a little more commonplace, uh, the opportunity to have artists fly to space. And 
to paint or draw or compose a poem or describe what they're seeing, um, I think is going to be very powerful uh, to share that, that very human experience and interpretation of what they're seeing with, with people on the earth. Next up, we have Ellie. Ellie, are you ready? There's Ellie in a really hey, cool Ellie. shirt. I, I like, like your shirt. That is awesome. You're sporting the NASA worm. Good Thank deal. You. Hi, Joe. I'm Ellie. My first question is, how do you wash your hands in space? Ellie, great question. And of course, just like it's super important to wash our hands here on Earth, especially during this time, um, we have to wash our hands in space to, uh, to stay healthy. And so we don't have running water in space. We don't have like a faucet or a spigot that we can go to that releases water so that we can wash our hands. So we basically use um, kind of like huggy wipes, you know, those uh, the wet wipes that have a little bit of soap in them. And that's what we will use to kind of disinfect our hands. Um, and then we don't, we can't take showers or baths while we're in space. So we will essentially use a washcloth to clean up with and we'll squirt hot water on that and then actually a little bit of a soap solution and you can use that to wash your hands and, and also to wash your body. My second question is what does it feel like when you come back to earth with gravity? Yeah Ellie I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier um, so I love the earth I, we all love the earth we all love to come home it's where our families are um, everything that we know and love is here on the earth uh, but you do miss weightlessness when you come back to the earth. Uh, every astronaut will tell you that gravity is a bummer. Um, I remember when I first got back and I was crawling out of the capsule, the hatch was down in front of me and I, in my brain, I was just saying, okay, I'm just going to release my straps and then I'm just going to crawl out on all fours, uh, to get out of the capsule. And immediately as I got on all fours, I face planted and, uh, and it wasn't because I was weak. In fact, I was just as strong um, when I got back to earth as when I left because we work out every day. It's just that my brain could not comprehend how heavy my body was going to be to prepare my arms to hold my body up. And, uh, and then I also remember flying home on the plane. And we have these headphones that we use. And they had brought some for me so that I could listen to music while we were flying back home. And they're the same headphones that we have on the space station. And I could have sworn that somebody, uh, that one of my friends was playing a joke on me and that they had like loaded nickels into the headphones or something because they felt incredibly heavy compared to these headphones that I had in space. Um, and so it takes a little while, it really takes a little while for your brain to adjust, to understand just how heavy your body is, how heavy your, your head is and uh, how heavy things are around you. Um, but you, you make that adjustment very quickly, but, uh, but gravity is kind of a bummer when you get back. Mm -hmm. Good job, Ellie. Joe, we have some of the teachers of these students that are going to be joining us now, and they have a question for you as well. So if we can get all the teachers on. Hi, Joe. Hey, Emma. Hi, I'm Emma Zydema, and we are all third grade teachers in Fairfax, Virginia. Thank you so much for being here with us. Fairfax, Virginia. Awesome. Yes, you know it well, yes. Um, the question from the teachers is, what advice do you have for any student who would like to follow in your footsteps? Thank you. Thank you for that question. So um, whether it is to become an astronaut, an engineer, an artist, a teacher, a dancer, uh, Whatever the goal, the, the secret to achieving that goal um, is one, there are secrets to achieving that goal. One is that it is achievable. You simply have to, to establish that goal and identify, hey, this is what I wanna do uh, when I grow up, or, or this is something that, that I wanna do. Establish it and then share it with people. Let your teachers know, let your family know, let your friends know that this is something that you're working on. Um, and you will be, I think, pleasantly surprised on, uh, about how uh, enthusiastic your friends, your family, your teachers and mentors are about helping you on that journey. And then the number two uh, secret is that it takes hard work. And so um, if it's something that you want to achieve and if it's something that's worth doing, it requires hard work. It means making sacrifices 
and maybe not right when you get home, you know, immediately jumping on the computer and playing 30 minutes or an hour of computer games. Maybe it means spending a little bit of time just getting into a book and learning more about that thing that you're really interested in. And so just in these little small steps, if you invest a little bit of time every day in achieving that goal, um, it's amazing at what you'll accomplish. Awesome. Well, teachers, thank you all for inspiring the next generation of explorers. We appreciate everything that you do. Chell, we're just about out of time here, but we do have one more guest that we want to bring in, but they do not have a question for you. As a matter of fact, Beth and I are going to ask them some questions about you. We have uh -huh. Mrs. Kime, your high school calculus teacher with us today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, Mrs. Kime. It's so good to see you. Oh my gosh. It's great to see you. You look wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. You do too. It's wow. You know, they asked me what bad things I could say about you, but <laughs> I couldn't think of a one. Oh. <laughs> Mrs. Wow. What kind of student was Chell? Was he good at math or not? <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, of course, I had him in calculus, uh, which is the best, and he was the best. Uh, he was a great student. I don't think he ever made anything below an A. Did you, Chell? Um, I, I had good grades. I worked hard <laughs> for them. <laughs> he did work hard, and, you know, for all my little naughty boys, he was never one of them. <laughs> 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 well, Mrs. Kime, thank you for joining us. Chell, what was she like as a teacher? Oh, she was awesome. And uh, uh, just so. <laughs> you guys, excuse me. Uh, I am uh, just so grateful uh, to, to Mrs. Kime and, uh, and, you know, all the other teachers that are represented here uh, for their investment in students. Uh, you know, I think all of us uh, in the astronaut office and uh, You guys are stinkers. <laughs> <laughs> but I never made him cry. <laughs> I don't know. I think I, I think I remember a couple of tests that might have uh, put me on the edge, Mrs. Kime. Uh, we are so grateful for the investment of uh, people like Mrs. Kime and Emma and Kathy and uh, the other teachers that are here today um, investing in us uh, and being a part of a journey where we get to, to realize our dreams. So thank you. And, and it's students like you that make me feel like everything I did was worthwhile. Thank Love you, Phil. So <laughs> Love you too, Mrs. Kime. <laughs> so good to see you. Well, let's have all of our students and teachers and everybody in the background unmute for a second. To all of you watching today, we appreciate it. We hope you have a great and Thank happy you. new year. Take care. Thank you all. You happy too. new year, everybody. Happy, happy new year. Holidays. Bye.